Tennyson's Mariana puts on bright display two of the primary features of, of Tennyson's work. First of all, we see a stylistic virtuosity that will strike us from poem to poem. Tennyson is notorious for his extremely intricate rhyme schemes, his sound effects, his rhythmical effects. He was a true master of the musicality of verse. Uh, we see this in the very first stanza. I'll just give you some examples. Um, first, we should note that the poem is composed of, of several 12-line uh, stanzas. Uh, the lines are generally in tetrameter, iambic tetrameter, I should say. That's, that's four iams. And the rhyme scheme that Tennyson come, came up with is quite intricate. It goes like this, A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, E, F, E, F. So 12 stanzas, I am a tetrameter, a complicated rhyme scheme, but what really makes Tennyson's verse come alive are, are the sound effects within the lines. His end rhymes are, are quite lovely, but it's the internal rhymes that really give the music, musicality to his, to his verse, the, the alliteration, the consonants, and the assonance. And very often this the sounds reinforce the the meanings that are expressed by the words so we can look for instance in stanza one where um i'll, I'll come in the middle uh tennyson is here describing the the um, house in which mariana lives all alone pining day and night for her lover angela who will never come of course this is drawn from shakespeare's play measure for measure where we simply see the, the, the phrase Mariana in the moated grange, and that is the um, epigraph for the poem. We learn that the broken sheds look sad and strange, unlifted was the clinking latch. So hear the O sounds in that first line, the broken sheds looked sad and strange. So you see that the O sounds picking up with each other, and you'll notice that the O sound is spoken at the front of the mouth. There's something forward um, about, about that sound. Ooh, uh, the broken sheds looked sad and strange. Then, of course, we have these, these S sounds. Um, sheds, sad, strange. Um, this is also a sound that's kind of in the front of the mouth. It's not so much made with the lips, the S sound. It's made with the tongue against the teeth. S -s -s. But you can hear... Um, good old-fashioned alliteration here. Sheds, that's not a pure S sound, but close. Sheds, sad, strange. So we have the O sounds speaking to each other. We have the S sounds speaking to each other. And what else? Uh, we have A sounds speaking to each other. Sad, strange, right? Um, that's more in the back of the mouth. But the, the way there's a kind of rhythm to, to the line where it's like Tennyson is moving our, our, our mouth sort of back and forth like, oh, s ah. Um, so, so it takes a kind of embodiment to really capture the rhythms of, of Tennyson's language. Now, of course, any great stylist will, will do this, but I want to focus on something else that we see in Tennyson. You, you'll notice that um, the line I just focused on, the broken sheds look sad and strange. There is a feeling of the sheds are broken, they're falling, they're decaying. Uh, and and these, these O sounds suggest a kind of slowness, suggesting a slow, steady decay. Um, but then the S sounds suggest a kind of quicker, uh, a, a quicker action, um, suggesting that there is slow decay, there is also quick decay. At a certain point, the decay will lead to a total collapse. Now, did, did Tennyson intend to, to play these um, O's and S's off each other? Probably not. It just came to him intu intuitively, which often happens with a poet. Now, you may say, well, why? Sure, surely uh, you're making too much of this and connecting his sounds to the very action of decay. Well, look at the next stanza. The broken sheds looks, I'm sorry, the next line. The broken sheds look sad and strange. Unlifted was the clinking latch. Now you can immediately um, hear the I sounds, lift, clink. You hear, you hear L sounds, clink, latch. Um, you hear N sounds, un, in. Unlifted was the clinking latch. Now, can you hear the k, k the, the C sound? 
um, there's something clinking and clicky about that sound. So the very words suggest the clinking of a latch. Um, notice they're, they're crisper and quicker, these sounds, than the sounds um, in the broken sheds look sad and strange. The broken sheds look sad and strange. And lifted was the clinking latch. She had this kind of interplay between this, this slow, oh, uh, decay and, and stasis, um, possibly quickened from time to time by the S sound, S sound. But then you get this counter sound. And lifted was the clinking latch, um, where the very sounds of the words click, 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 and clink. This is just one example. You can find this at play in almost all of Tennyson, Tennyson's verse. It's really quite rewarding to analyze his sound effects. So, stylistic virtuosity. Two, what's the poem about? It's about the ills of melancholy isolation. We basically see a woman here going slowly insane uh, because time for her has stopped. She's so obsessed with missing her beloved. She's so melancholy that ultimately everything around her is a reminder of what she does not have. So her life is basically the same from day to day, from night to night. You'll notice that the poem moves back and forth between descriptions of the day and descriptions of the night. The key is there's not much changes. There's, there's not a sense of, oh my gosh, this is day, that's good. Oh my gosh, there's night, I can rest. None of that. There's a, there's a flattening. Just as so the Grange itself is flat. So there's a monotony. And of course, Tennyson emphasizes this by ending all the stanzas almost the same way. Um, my life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. Uh, no, she only said, my life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I'm weary, a weary, I wish that I were dead. Um, the next stanza, she only said, the night is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I'm weary, I'm weary, I wish that I were dead. Uh, so there's a slight change there. There's a slight change. We move from life to night, and sometimes we see day show up um, in that place. But there's a sense here that everything is the same. And this is what deep melancholy feels like, again, because everything, no matter how different it may seem, everything reminds you of your pain. And therefore, everything on some level is exactly the same. So the first stanza, we get this description of the, of the decay of, of her house. Um, the next stanza, we get a sense of, well, you know what? Um, she herself, um, within this decaying house, she cries at nighttime, she cries in the morning time. So there's this cyclicity, this vicious um, circularity, I should say, to her life. And then we learn in the third stanza exactly what her problem is. That, um, okay, so the cocks sung out an hour ere light from the dark fin. The oxen's low came to her without hope of change. In sleep she seemed to walk forlorn without hope of change. So the monotony of the poem is prevalent. And again, that's, that's how deep melancholia feels, especially when it's isolated. But there are two changes in the poem, we might say. Well, at least two. There, there, there are some others. But one is um, breaking the monotony of, of the Grange is this poplar tree, which shows up in stanza four. Uh, poplar shook all way, all silver green with gnarled bark. For leagues no other tree did mark. And then the next stanza, stanza five, we learned that the shadow of the poplar falls across her bed. And then in the final stanza, we see that um, the wind and the poplar interact. The sparrows cheer up on the roof, the slow clock ticking. Hear that clock ticking? There's that sound effect again. Um, and the sound which to the wooing wind aloof the poplar made. So, so what is this poplar doing? Well, one can say, oh, well, it's, it's a symbol of fertility. It's a, it's a phallic symbol, we could say. Um, and so it symbolizes to her a kind of masculine fertility that she desires but, but lacks. So the fecundity of the landscape is not a sign of hope. It's a sign of the opposite because it's a marker of what she does not have. We could also look at this um, mythologically. Um, a, a naiad, Enoni, uh, falls in love with Paris, the, 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 the beautiful man who actually, of course, abducts Helen to start the Trojan War. And Paris carves on a poplar tree his vow to her that he will never leave her. Of course, he leaves her immediately when he sees Helen. So in terms of this allusion, the poplar tree is here um, duplicitous. On the one hand, it suggests fertility. On the other hand, it suggests a broken vow. So the only change in the landscape does not help. It only hurts more. Second, there is a slight progression of the poem 
we see Mariana go increasingly insane, we might say. What do I mean by that? Well, by the time we get to the third stanza, the, the penultimate stanza, we see this, that as she makes her way around the moldering wainscot, um, she sees old faces through the doors and old footsteps trod the upper floors and old voices called her from without. So now she's starting to hallucinate. She's so consumed by the past that is now gone, but a past that she wishes to relive. The past is more important to her than the present. The present is only pain. The past was a time when she was with um, her beloved. So now she's hearing things as if, as if time itself has collapsed. There's no distinction between past and present. So we might say that this hallucination is a mark of what we would call psychosis. She's losing a reality principle. The distinction between her thoughts and things has dissolved. And this is made very clear in the final stanza. The sparrows cheer up on the roof, the slow clock ticking, and the sound which to the wooing wind aloof the poplar made did all confound her sense. So her sense is confounded. And But most she loathed the hour when the thick moted sunbeam lay athwart the chambers and the day was sloping toward his eastern bower. Then she said, I am very dreary. He will not come, she said. She wept. I'm a weary, I'm a weary. Oh God, that I were dead. So here we see that she weeps. Earlier she, she said, here she weeps. So there's a change there. And of course, the, there's also a change with her saying, not I would that I were dead, but oh God, that I were dead. So there's an intensification of her melancholy until by the end she's falling in, into out and out psychosis. Uh, so in some ways, this poem ends much like Poe's The Raven ends. They're very different poems, but at the end of The Raven, you see the speaker staring at this bird on top of the bust of Pallas Athena. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm there still suggesting that he's kind of caught in this world. He's so consumed by his sorrow that he's lost all touch with the present moment and has lived utterly in the past, to the point where time is simply stasis. And the fact that the epigraph of this poem says Miriana and the Moated Grange is significant in that there is no verb in that, in that phrase. And her life is devoid of verbs, we might say. And the only verbs that are suggested um, only make her pain worse. So we'll see this theme of isolated melancholy show up several times in, in Tennyson's po poetry, just as we'll see his virtuosic um, sound effects.